Podcasts presents an unabridged recording of Dark Lover by J.R. Ward. Narrated by Jim Frangione and directed. by Danny Snelson. This is Ben Thought we'd go ahead and enjoy this lovely story by the lovely author J.R. Ward. The beginning of her Black, Black Dagger Brotherhood series is something I think would be enjoyable to listen to. Without further ado, Dark Lover. This book is copyrighted 2005 by Jessica Bird. This recording is copyrighted 2009 by Recorded Books, producer and publisher of Romantic Sounds, an imprint that features dramatic tales that will carry you away to exotic locales and sweep you off your feet. In the shadows of the night in Caldwell, New York, there's a deadly turf war going on between vampires and their slayers. But there also exists a secret band of brothers like no other. Six vampire warriors, defenders of their race, yet none of them relishes killing their enemies more than Wrath, the leader of the Black Dagger Brotherhood. And now, Dark Lover. Chapter One Darius looked around the club, taking in the teeming, half-naked bodies on the dance floor. Screamers was packed tonight, full of women wearing leather and men who looked like they had advanced degrees in violent crime. Darius and his companion fit right in, except they actually were killers. So you're really going to do this? Torment asked him. Darius glanced across the shallow table. The other vampire's eyes met his own. Yeah, I am. Torment nursed his scotch and smiled grimly. Only the very tips of his fangs showed. You're crazy, D. You should know. Torment tilted his glass in deference. But you're raising the bar. You want to take an innocent girl who has no idea what the hell she's getting into and put her transition in the hands of someone like Wrath. That's whacked. He isn't evil, in spite of the way he looks. Darius finished his beer and show a little respect. I respect the hell out of him, but it's a bad idea. I need him. You sure about that? A woman wearing a micro-mini, thigh-high boots and a bustier made of chains trolled by their table. Her eyes glittered from behind two pounds of mascara, and she worked her walk as if her hips were double-jointed. Darius gave her a pass. Sex was not on his mind tonight. She's my daughter, Tor. She's a half-breed, D. And you know how he feels about humans. Torment shook his head. My great-great-grandmother was one, and you don't see me yakking that up around him. Darius lifted his hand to catch their waitress's eye and pointed at his empty bottle and Torment's nearly dry glass. I'm not going to let another one of my children die. Not if there's a possibility I can save her. And anyway... There's no telling whether she'll even go through the change. She could end up living a happy life, never knowing about my side. It's happened before. And he hoped his daughter would be spared, because if she went through her transition, if she came out alive on the other side as a vampire, she was going to be hunted as they all were. Darius, if he does it at all, he'll do it because he owes you, not because he wants to. I'll take him any way I can get him. But what are you giving her? He's about as nurturing as a sawed-off. And that first time can be sawed rough, off, huh? even Good if you've been Lord, prepared. Which she hasn't. I'm going to talk to her. And how's that going to go? You're just going to walk up to her and say, Hey, I know you've never seen me before, but I'm your dad. Oh, and guess what? You've won the evolutionary lottery. You're a vampire. Let's go to Disneyland. I hate you right now. Torment leaned forward, his thick shoulders shifting under black leather, 
You know I got your back. I'm just thinking you should reconsider. There was a heavy pause. Maybe I could do it. Darius shot him a dry look. You want to try to get back into your house after the fact? Wellsy will stake you through the heart and leave you for the sun, my friend. Torment winced. Good point. And then she'll come looking for me. Both males shuddered. Besides, Darius leaned back as the waitress put their drinks down. He waited until she left, even though hardcore rap was pumping all around them. Besides, we're living in dangerous times. If something happens to me, I'll take care of her. Darius clapped his friend on the shoulder. I know you will. But wrath is better. There was no jealousy in the remark. It was a statement of fact. There's no one like him. And thank God for that, Torment said with a half-smile. Their band of brothers, a tight circle of strong-backed warriors who traded information and fought together, were of the same opinion. Wrath was off the chain when it came to the business of vengeance, and he hunted their enemies with a single-minded purpose that bordered on the insane. He was the last of his line, the only purebred vampire left on the planet, and though his race revered him as its king, he despised his status. It was almost tragic that he was the best bet Darius's half-breed daughter had of surviving. Wrath's blood, so strong, so untainted, would increase the chances of her getting through the transition if it hit her. But torment wasn't off the mark. It was like turning a virgin over to a thug. With a sudden rush, the crowd shifted, people backing into each other. They were making way for someone, or something. Shit, here he comes, Torment muttered. He tossed back his scotch, swallowing it whole. No offense, but I'm outie. This is not a conversation I need to be a part of. Darius watched the sea of humans split as they steered clear of an imposing dark shadow that towered over them. The flight response was a good survival reflex. Wrath was six feet six inches of pure terror. Oh. <laughs> 250 pounds of frontier justice. <laughs> You must be very proud of yourself. Yes, I am. Dressed in leather. His hair was long and black, falling straight from a widow's peak. Wrap-around sunglasses hid eyes that no one had ever seen revealed. Shoulders were twice the size of most males. With a face that was both aristocratic and brutal, he looked like the king he was by birthright and the soldier he'd become by destiny. And that wave of menace rolling ahead of him was one hell of a calling card. As the cool hatred hit Darius, he tilted his fresh beer back and drank deeply. He hoped to God he was doing the right thing. Beth Randall looked up as her editor leaned his hip on her desk. His eyes went straight to the V of her shirt. Working late again, he murmured. Hey, Dick, shouldn't you be getting home to your wife and two kids? Wow. She mentally added. Wow. What are you doing? Wow. Editing a piece for Tony. Wow. You know, there are other ways of impressing me. Yeah, she could hey, just imagine. Grow up. Did you read my email, Dick? I went down to the police station this afternoon and talked with Jose and Ricky. They swear a gun dealer's moved into town. They found two modified magnums on drug dealers. Dick reached out to pat her shoulder, stroking it as he took his hand back. You just keep working the blotter. Let the big boys worry about the violent crimes. We wouldn't want anything to happen to that pretty face of yours. He smiled, eyes growing hooded as his gaze lingered on her lips. That stare routine had gotten old three years ago, she thought, right after she'd started working for him. A paper bag. What she needed was a paper bag to pull over her head whenever she talked with him. Maybe with a picture of Mrs. Dick taped to the front. Would you like me to give you a ride home? He asked. Only if it were raining thumbtacks and hairpins, you lech. No thanks. 
Beth turned back to her computer screen and hoped he'd take the hint. Eventually, he wandered off, probably heading for the bar across the street that most of the reporters hit before going home. Caldwell, New York wasn't exactly a hotbed of opportunity for any journalist, but Dick's big boys sure liked keeping up the appearance of carrying a heavy social burden. They relished cozying up to the bar at Charlie's and talking about the days when they'd worked at bigger, more important pay. Yeah, so we had to pause for a brief intermission. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, she said Frontier Justice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, Rat seems scary as heck. He said, like, basically, from what I heard, he don't like humans, he's the king, mm. and he don't want to be the king. He doesn't want to be the king. No, he hates it, didn't you he hear? He no. hates being called king. Uh, he is the king, so he's but still he kind of he's kind of princey then. Mm, when I said frontier justice, that's closer. He's more like Batman with fangs. So Batman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, that, that makes sense. For the most part, they were just like Dick, middle-aged. Middle-of-the-road men who were competent, but not extraordinary at what they did. Caldwell was big enough and close enough to New York City to have the nasty business of violent crimes, drug busts, and prostitution, so they were kept busy. But the Caldwell Courier Journal was not the Times, and none of them was ever going to win a Pulitzer. It was rather sad. Yeah, well, look in the mirror, Beth thought. She was just a beat reporter. She'd never even worked at a national level paper. Treasure trove of caloric depravity. She peeled off the cellophane and couldn't believe she was biting into the artificial swill as she hit the lights and walked down the stairwell to Trade Street. Outside, the heat of July was a physical barrier between her and her apartment. Twelve straight blocks of hot and humid. Fortunately, the Chinese restaurant was halfway home and heavily air-conditioned. With any luck, they'd be busy tonight, so she'd get to wait a while in the coolness. When she was finished with the Twinkie, she flipped open her phone, hit speed dial, and put in an order for beef with broccoli. Okay, cool. So, flip phones. Tells you about the times. Well, it's book was written in 2005. We heard that in the beginning. Yeah. So, I mean, that was before I graduated from high school, and I know I had a flip phone after I graduated from high school, and that's when I thought that I mean, that's when I thought it was cool. Uh, what was that? Uh, the, the Razor phones? Maybe yeah, phone. the Razor, but it was the little one, you know what I mean? The, the miniature Razor? What are those? The, I think the they were Crazers. It's K-R-A-Z, you know what I mean? It was little. Uh, I don't remember that one. We're gonna have to like look that one up for real. Google it. Yeah, I'm gonna have to check that. Okay, so looking at it right now, I don't really see. I see the there Mystique LX laser, razor, and crazer. The, the motor alert crazer K1. Is that what it is? Okay, yeah. So, like that? Yeah, I did see these ones before. Come to think of it. Huh. Man, where are the times? As she walked along, <laughs> she looked at the familiar, grim landmarks. Along this stretch of Trade Street, there were only bars, strip clubs, and the occasional tattoo parlor. The Chinese food place and the Tex-Mex buffet were the only two restaurants. The rest of the buildings, which had been used as offices in the 20s, when downtown had been thriving, were vacant. She knew every crack in the sidewalk. She could time the traffic lights. And the patois of sounds drifting out of open doors and windows offered no surprises either. McGrider's bar was playing blues. Zero Sum had bleeding techno coming out of its glass entrance. And the karaoke machines were fired up at Rubens. Most of the places were reputable enough, but there were a couple she stayed away from on principle. 
Screamers, in particular, catered to a scary-ass clientele. That was one door she wouldn't go through without a police escort. As she measured the distance to the Chinese restaurant, a wave of fatigue hit her. God, it was humid. The air was so heavy, she felt as if she were breathing water. She had a feeling the exhaustion wasn't just about the weather. She'd been pooped for weeks and suspected she was dancing with depression. Her job was going nowhere. She was living in a place she didn't care about. She had few friends, no lover, and no romantic prospects. If she looked ahead ten years and pictured herself staying put in Caldwell with Dick and the big boys, she only saw more of the same routine. Get trying to make a difference. Failing. Going home alone. Maybe she just needed out. Out of Caldwell. Out of the CCJ. Out of the electronic family of her alarm clock and the phone on her desk and the TV that kept her dreams away while she slept. God knew there was nothing keeping her in town but habit. She hadn't spoken to any of her foster parents for years, so they wouldn't miss her. And the few friends she had were busy with their own families. When she heard a leering whistle behind her, she rolled her eyes. That was the problem with working near the bars. On occasion, you picked up gawkers. The catcalls came next, and then, sure enough, two guys crossed the street at a jog and came after her. She looked around. She was heading away from the bars and into the long stretch of vacant buildings before the restaurants. The night was thick and dark, but at least there were streetlights and the occasional car passing. I like your black hair, the big one said as he fell into step beside her. Mind if I touch it? Beth knew better than to stop. They looked like college frat boys out for the summer, which meant they were just going to be annoying, but she didn't want to take any chances. Besides, the Chinese place was only five blocks up. She reached into her purse anyway, searching for her pepper spray. You need a ride somewhere? The big guy asked. My car's not far. Seriously, how about you come with us? We could go for a little ride. He grinned and winked at his buddy, as if the smooth rap was definitely going to get him laid. The crony laughed and circled her, his thin blonde hair flopping as he skipped. Let's ride her, the blonde said. Damn it, where was her spray? The big one reached out, touching her hair, and she looked at him good and hard. With his polo shirt and his khaki shorts, he was BMOC handsome, real all-American material. When he smiled at her, she sped up, focusing on the dim neon glow of the Chinese place's sign. She was praying someone else would walk by, but heat had driven the pedestrian traffic indoors. There was no one around. You want to tell me your name? All-American asked. Her heart started banging in her chest. The spray was in her other bag. Four more blocks. Maybe I'll just pick a name for you. Let me think. How's pussycat sound? The blonde giggled. She swallowed and took out her cell phone, just in case she needed to call 911. Stay calm. Keep it together. She pictured how good the rush of air conditioning in the restaurant was going to feel as she went inside. Maybe she'd wait and call a cab, just to make sure she got home without being further harassed by them. Come on, pussycat. All-American cooed. I know you're going to like me. Only three more blocks. Just as she stepped off the curb to cross 10th Street, he grabbed her around the waist. Her feet popped off the ground, and as he dragged her backward, he covered her mouth with a heavy palm. She fought like a madwoman, kicking and punching. And when she reached behind him and belted him in the eye, his grip slipped. She lunged away from him, legs driving her heels hard into the pavement, breath trapped in her throat. A car went by out on Trade Street, and she yelled as its headlights flared. But then he got her again. You're going to beg for it, bitch. All Americans said in her ear as he put her in a chokehold. He wrenched her neck around until she thought it was going to snap and pulled her deeper into the shadows. She could smell his sweat and the college boy cologne he wore, could hear the high-pitched laughter of his friend. An alley. They were taking her into an alley. Her stomach heaved, bile stinging her throat, 
and she jerked her body around furiously, trying to get free. Panic made her strong, but he was stronger. He pushed her behind a dumpster and pressed his body into hers. She drove her elbow into his ribs and kicked some more. God damn it, get her arms! She got in one good heel punch to the blonde's shins before he caught her wrists and held them over her head. Come on, bitch, you're gonna like this, All-American growled, trying to get his knee between her legs. He ground her back against the building's brick wall, holding her in place by the throat. He had to use his other hand to rip open her shirt, and as soon as her mouth was free, she screamed. He slapped her hard, and she felt her lips split open. Blood rushed onto her tongue, pain stunning her. You do that again, and I'm cutting your tongue out. All American's eyes boiled with hate and lust as he shoved up the white lace of her bra and exposed her breasts. Hell, I think I'll do that anyway. Hey, are those real? The blonde asked as if she would answer him. His buddy grabbed one of her nipples and pulled. She winced, tears making her vision swim. Or maybe her eyesight was going because she was hyperventilating. All American laughed. I think she's natural, but you can find out for yourself when I'm finished. As the blonde giggled, some deep part of her brain kicked into gear and refused to let this happen. She forced herself to stop fighting and reached back to her self-defense training. Except for her heavy breathing, her body went still, and it took All-American a minute to notice. You want to play nice? he said, eyeing her with suspicion. She nodded slowly. Good. He leaned in, his breath filling her nose. She fought not to cringe at the rank smell of stale cigarettes and beer. But if you scream again, I'm going to stab you. Do you understand me? She nodded once more. Let her go. The blonde dropped her wrists and giggled, moving around them as if he were looking for the best angle. All American's hands were rough on her skin as he fondled her, and she held Tony's Twinkie down by force of will, her gag reflex pumping her throat. Even though she loathed the sensation of the palms pushing into her breasts, she reached for the fly of his pants. He was still holding her by the neck, and she was having trouble breathing, but the moment she touched his privates, he moaned and his grip loosened. With a hard jam of her hand, she grabbed his balls, twisted as hard as she could, and kneed him in the nose as he crumbled. Adrenaline shot through her, and for a split second, she wished his buddy would come at her instead of staring at her stupidly. Fuck you! She screamed at them both. Beth bolted out of the alley, holding her shirt together as she ran, and she didn't stop until she was at the door to her apartment building. Her hands were shaking so badly she could barely get her key in the locks. And it wasn't until she stood in front of her mirror in the bathroom that she realized tears were pouring down her face. Butch O'Neill looked up when the police radio under the dash of his unmarked patrol car went off. There was a male victim, down but breathing, in an alley not so far away. Butch checked his watch, a little after 10 o'clock, which meant the fun was just getting started. It was a Friday night in the early part of July, so the college Turks were still fresh out of school and aching to compete in the stupid Olympics. He figured the guy had either been mugged or taught a lesson. He hoped it was the latter. Butch grabbed the handset and told dispatch he'd head over even though he was a homicide detective, not a beat cop. He had two cases he was working right now, one floater in the Hudson River and a hit and run, but there was always room for something else. As far as he was concerned, the more time away from home, the better. The dirty dishes in his sink and the wrinkled sheets on his bed were not going to miss him. He hit the siren and the gas and thought, let's hear it for the boys of summer. Okay, so we're going to toss in some comments now. Did you? Oh no. <laughs> hey. She got away though. She did her thing. She said, not today, Satan. Not today. <laughs> no. I feel so bad for her. Well, 
personally. Uh-uh. <laughs> there was a lot going on. Um, it got pretty suspenseful right at the point where uh, they ran across the street. She was trying to get, make it quick to the restaurant, and tsk, wow. Like a pizza. <laughs> You're mine. Is that how abductions happen? Yes. That's exactly how abductions happen. People will be like, oh, they look like buttheads, but they're probably harmless. And then the next thing you know, you're snatched up and on the back of a freaking milk carton. Wow. So what are your takeaways? Okay, so what I've learned from this first chapter is is that she is a half-breed vampire. Mm-hmm. Um, she's transitioning, even though she can't very well, you know, she can't tell because she has no knowledge of any of this. Mm-hmm. Um, her senses are being heightened. Mm-hmm. Um, she is in a world of just never-ending... Monotony? <laughs> it's boring. She's, she's, her life is boring, sir. Oh, you want some excitement? Yeah, here's your excitement. You're getting ogled all over the place, and it's just become so monotonous that um, you wanted something to happen. Well, guess what? Something happened. Oh, no. I bet you'll never wish for anything happen ever again. Why did I wish for this adventure? <sighs> Sleep, sleep with heavy tears. Unfortunately. Well, when they're gonna show up at our apartment and like do some stuff? They're gonna be like, oh my gosh, wait a minute! I need to call the police on my cell phone. You should have used the moment you decide. I mean, when did she call the police though? I mean, did she call the police when she saw that blonde circle around her? That that would have been the red flag right there. Like, yeah. yeah the red flag was the red flag. Well, wouldn't even have got to that point. As soon as you see some cops like roll by or drive by, and you're doing what you're doing, suspicious activity, and all she has to do is just yell or scream that she's being harassed. That's it. You're being watched. You're under. You're under suspicion. And they'll think twice. I don't think they'll think twice. I think that guy is going to hold a grudge. First of all, for him to be labeled as a victim, you realize he's claiming to be a victim in that alleyway, right? No, he is not the victim. He does not deserve any treatment. Except for reconstruction of his testicles. Well... That was the first chapter. Not a bad... Not a bad start. Not a bad start. I still want to look more into, like, Wrath's side of the story. I don't know why. The Wrath of the Vampire side of the story. But you gotta take them both in, you know? You gotta take the good, you take the bad, you take them both, and there you have. The narrator writes from that person's perspective, though. You see how we heard from Darius, right? Darius, when he was hanging out with Torment. And then we heard from Beth, right, when she was at her job. And then we heard from Butch when he was going to pick up the picture. Comic book style. Without the Deadpool. Right. Oh, but they are kind of, but no, they're not. They're superheroes, too, though. Spoiler alert warning. Spoiler alert warning. Yeah. And they don't have to drink blood, or they have to drink blood? They, no, they drink don't blood. Have. They drink blood from their lovers. They drink blood from uh, somebody who's the opposite sex of sex. They can't drink blood from the same sex. It'll kill them. Like a male vampire can't drink from a male vampire. And a female vampire can't drink from a female vampire. Strange. That is weird, I thought. Can they drink from a female human? No. It won't sustain them. They need to drink from a vampire. Right. Even if they drank from, like, three different humans? Still nope, it still doesn't do what it's supposed to do. It is. Well, okay, hold on, that's wrong. Spoiler. 
is a vampire who only drinks from humans. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and leave that there. Well, you know, thanks for listening. I mean, Enjoy this story with us. Let's find out what happens between <laughs> Raz and Beth and how you enjoyed it. It's good, huh? So far, so good. I um, mean, it's not like I want to put it down. I seriously want to put it down. But no, um, it's it's an interesting one. In fact, I own this one as well as the third one. I do not have the second. <gasps> Blasphemer? Yeah. The second one is my favorite. Then again, it's my own crime for not being an addict. I'm gonna let it go. Thank you for you know. Thank you for your participation. Join us next time for chapter two of Dark Leather.